You are in a precious time of your academic career. I need your undivided focus. Undivided focus. Attention. You are in your precious academic career. You know that, right? You're at a point where guidance counselors are now saying to you, junior year is the most important year. <laughs> Say it. Who said that? Every year? Thank, don't be shy. That's a power word. Every year was the most important year of your academic career. Every year. Next year, a lot of you are going to cry. No, you're going to graduate. But a lot of you are going to cry. Because you know, I'm going to tell you why. You're going to go to that mailbox. You're going to go to the mailbox because you had colleges on your mind that you really wanted to go to. And not one of you probably have taken the time out to say, what is that college looking for? Besides extracurricular activity skills, I'm a, I'm a nice yeah. person. I was class president. I was, you know, Fossidy, you know, all of that. It's the academics, it's the academics, it's the academics. But guess what? Now is the time to begin to fix it. Now is the time to begin to fix it. I wish that I would have came here on the first day you started junior year. Because some of you still had the same pattern of ninth and 10th grade academically. I'm not here to promote fear. I'm here to tell you about my struggle, how I gain strength, and how I gain freedom. I'm here to tell you why college was so important to me. I'm here to tell you how to navigate around a guy like me next year, this very same time, when all of you will be filling out the application, having these big hopes for the colleges of your choice. And each and every one of you had the opportunity to have full control over that admissions counselor. That would be the second part of my, thought, my talk. The first part of my talk is to let you know why college was so important to me. But I need your undivided attention. Your juniors, please listen. This to me is so important to you. I know you have your friends next to you. I know it's important to, you know, putz around with them, but I need you to listen. Because if you're listening, the majority of you will be able to turn your lives around academically. Every college in this country wants students that look like you. The fastest growing population in colleges today are Latinos and Latinas. But the ones who are on those good college campuses, they realize what they had to do. And they didn't go to school. They came to work every day. And you're sitting here in such a beautiful building. This building looks like a corporate office. I go to a lot of schools around the country, and I walk in, and they look like penitentiaries. But you are in a beautiful place. So let's begin. I was born in the Deep South. This is why college was so important to me. I was born in the Deep South, 1949. People are saying, how old is this guy? <laughs> 64. <laughs> because I live a rewarding life. A life where I gain and a life where I want to give back. A life that I gain and a life that I want to share. And I'm here to share it with you. So I was born in 1949 in the Deep South when a guy that looks like me born to parents who were uneducated. I was born to a father who was a sharecropper, who worked the fields day in and day out. 
His father died of a massive heart attack when he was only in the sixth grade. He was a big guy. He needed to quit school in order to help his mother support his other four siblings. My mother quit school in the eighth grade. Her father died of pneumonia going to the marketplace to sell his goods. She needed to quit school to help mom support the other two younger siblings. Every morning we got up, every hand needed to be on deck. Right down the road from us, from sun up to sunset, there was farms in the middle of our neighborhoods. And those are the only kind of work we could do because we had no education. Those were long, long, long rows, and you had these baskets, and when you get to the baskets, you pick up the basket from one row, and you charge down the other row, picking string beans, tomatoes, cucumbers, digging wood, pulling watermelons, potatoes, whatever the crop was for the year, you were literally doing it, and you get all the way down to the other row, and you got 50 cents for that work. You got up early, you got up early, because you know by noon and by one to four o'clock, the sun was going to bake you. You were the first in the field to put your hands and move the dust of the pesticide and then sniffing in the pesticide and literally getting lung cancer, getting headaches and getting backaches and dying and getting infection on your skin. You would put your hand in picking string beans and a snake bite you. Day in and day out. I can remember going back home in this tree-lined southern street and you can hear the chirping of the frogs and the birds and the snake rustling across the street roads. I can remember a time, it was an Easter Saturday, going downtown. Mom loved putting Buster Brown shoes on us. You walk into a shoe shop, and you were not allowed to sit in the showroom. They quickly ushered you into the back stock room. Mom sits me down in a chair, five years old. A woman comes in with a brown paper bag. She takes the brown paper bag as mom still kneels on the floor with me. She's not looking up. That's being uppity. The woman tears open the bag. She tosses it down to mom. Mom takes my shoes off. She traces my footprint on the brown paper bag. She gives it to the woman. The woman puts the shoes on the tracing and asks, does that shoe fit your child? Yes, ma'am. She bows her head. Next door, there's a clothing shop. Mom is asking us, what do we want? I see the silk and shark skin suit, shiny gray. Mom, I'd love that suit, Mom. I'd love that hat. The woman takes the suit off of the rack. She holds it a foot away, and she says to your Mom, does that suit fit your child? Yes, ma'am. She takes the hat, Mom, I love that hat. She takes, the woman takes a brown paper bag, creates a little brown paper bag, and put a brown paper bag on top of your head, and then put a hat on top of your head, and says, does that, sh that hat fit your child? Yes, ma'am. Across the street, as we come out of the shop, this is beautiful park. Beautiful oak trees and Spanish moss and shadows like you won't believe to hide from the hot sun. Beautifully manicured flowers like you won't believe, azaleas in color. But a kid that looks like me, you can't even go in that park. Right across from the park is this beautiful hotel. You can go in there if you want to clean it, but you sure can't stay in it. Mom, I'm, I'm hungry, Mom, I'm hungry. The restaurants? You can't even go in. 
You go in the alley of the restaurant to get your food, and they stick the food out to you. You're paying the same money as the guy or the gal who sits at the counter. So mom and dad says, we can't live like this anymore. By 1900 in America, the Deep South, African Americans are leaving by the millions going up to the North for a better way of life. Can't take the Jim Crow way of life anymore. They go to the big cities, you got Chicago, you got Boston, you got New York, you got California. People are saying our relatives are going and they're saying life is better, life is better. People are getting on trains and leaving by the millions, and even at nights, you, you want to leave in a sort of a sort of a sort of quiet ways because the farmers don't really want you to leave because they're losing their workforce. So if they can intimidate you to stay, they're going to do that. So mom goes up to New York, and mom finds us a better place to stay. She sends us this beautiful little note card of Midtown Manhattan reflecting on the Hudson River. As a child, eight, nine years old, I'm thinking, wow, I can't wait to get to New York to live in those apartments. So when she says she finds an apartment, we have this beautiful 1950s Ford Green, 14-hour drive. Keep in mind, can't stay in hotels and can't stay in motels. It's a straight drive. There are six of us in this car. And you nestle any way you possibly can to be comfortable. You stop for gas, you stop for food. You stop for food, you get in the back of the restaurant in a little greasy alley to get your food and drive on. And all of a sudden you come to the Hudson, the um, um, New Jersey Parkway, and there, Night, we arrived in the evening, the water is still in class, and New York City is reflecting, and it reminded me of that postcard that mom had sent me, and I just couldn't wait to get there. Car comes out of the Lincoln Tunnel, and I'm holding on to the window, I'm looking up at this place, and I said, wow. But the car kept rolling, and the car kept rolling, and the car kept rolling, and all of a sudden, Midtown Manhattan is over the horizon. I arrived in Harlem, 127th Street. Buildings are shorter, streets are darker, and there's an antiquity smells about these buildings. There are people standing on the street. It's 1950, the drug of choice was heroin. I've never seen a gentleman or a woman stand on the street, fall to sleep, go all the way down to the ground, and all of a sudden bounce up. Mom ushers us out of that vehicle and she says, son, I want you to be careful. Don't you get involved with this element. Don't you do this. There are drunks who are staggering all over the road, all over the streets. They're fighting and cutting each other. I'm going, what in the world is this? I'm a southern kid. You don't see this in the south. The apartment that we are staying in, no bigger than probably from that wall to here. And there are seven of us in that apartment. And they're day beds. Parents fold the beds up at night. Children sleeping on the floor on the quilts. And they are roaches like you won't believe. A roach get in my, door, my sister's ear one night. They have to take it to the hospital to flush the roach out. This was better. Some of your parents in this room, some of you right in this room, parents may have said that we're moving you to someplace better, but you can make it better. You can make it better. You don't have to live it the way it is. You can make it better. So my parents got better jobs. All right, so when my parents weren't, my mother and father weren't working in the fields, and when the field crops were over, they were help. Anybody saw the movie The Help? 
All right, for those who saw the movie, my grandmother and grandfather, my grandmother and, grand, my, and mother were to help. And when the crops weren't working, that's what they did. And now mom gets, finally gets into New York in a small little apartment. And in this little apartment, you look down the hall because there's no kitchen in that place. You look down the hall and you use the kitchen down the hall. After Mrs. Jackson got through using the kitchen, you would use the kitchen to cook the food. There is no bathroom in that room. You wait for Miss Jackson family to get through to use the bathroom before you go to the bathroom. So finally, my parents are making more money. She's working from a McGraw, I mean, the Mayflower Hotel. She's not cleaning for one room or one house for the wealthy. She's cleaning 50 rooms a day. And dad, he's a custodian from McGraw Hill. It's better than working the fields making more money. So we move into a bigger apartment. And this apartment is called a railroad flat, a long hallway, long hallway, very much like this. And at the one end is a, is a master bathroom, bedroom, and the other end was the living room. And in this building, beyond the roaches, there were four squirrel-sized sewer rat that visited us every night. You open up the window and look out the back window and people were throwing food and garbage out the window. The backyard was infested with rats. And every night, you would hear the rats running through the ceiling, running through the walls. And my bed was right on the wall, and you can hear them just like almost playing in your ear. You can hear them chirping, just rustling. On the floor at night, you're afraid to even get up out of the bed, because you may step on one. My brother and I decided we are gonna wage war on these four squirrel-sized sewer rats. Can't kill all the cockroach, can't kill all the pimps, can't kill all the whores, can't kill all the stick-up guys, still can't kill all the druggies. But we can sure kill these squirrel-sized sewer rats that invaded our apartment every night. We go to Central Park, we're living on 115th Street, we go to Central Park, create bow and arrows using our southern skills, and we are going to wage war tonight. We'd already washed up, and the house quiets down at night. By 9.30, it's quiet. And all of a sudden, my mom would always leave the light on in the bathroom. And all of a sudden, the first rat came out of the bathroom. My brother snatches his legs up on the couch, pulls back on the bow, and releases the arrow. Missed the first one. All of a sudden, two came out of the bathroom. We're pulling back on our bow and releasing the arrow, pulling back on our bow and releasing the arrow, and we are now out of arrows. And we weren't going to go and get them. It's too dark over there. And the reason why we weren't going to go and get them, if you've ever cornered a sewer rat, you'll find out that it is quite dangerous. One day we're sitting in the kitchen, how dangerous sewer rats can be. One day we're in the kitchen having a sudden shutdown, piece of cornbread, some hot chocolate and tea, and all of a sudden this rat comes from out of the underneath the refrigerator. My brother grabs the broom to swat this rat. This rat ran up the broom on my brother's arm, up his arm, round his shoulder, and jump on the kitchen sink and behind the refrigerator. That's why you do not corner sewer rats. So, now that all of our arrows are on the other side of the enemy line, we weren't going to go and get it. We sat down to rethink our military strategy over some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Well, you look at me, you can possibly tell that I was the neat guy out of the, my brother and I. I wasn't going to go in the bathroom to wash up after that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. My brother and I went to bed. He didn't wash up. I went to the kitchen sink, swished my mouth out, washed my hands off. My brother came to bed. 
And believe me, my parents were extraordinary. Unfortunately, they were undereducated. My mother made beds that sheets were bleached and lightly starched. Our little skivvies when we went to bed at nights were bleach white. To this day, I don't know whether or not one rat was in bed with us or all four of those rats were in bed with us all night. Wherever my brother left peanut butter and jelly, the enemy invaded our camp and took the peanut butter and jelly. Every place he left it. When we left, when we woke up that morning, there was so much blood on that, in that bed. I said to myself, the only reason why we are in this predicament was because of the lack of education. Parents were not educated. It was the only reason why we are in this predicament. I said, education is going to give me freedom and opportunity. Education is going to give me freedom and opportunity. Education is going to give me freedom and opportunity. Education is going to give me freedom and opportunity. I want out. I will never raise my children like this. And keep in mind, please understand my parents were fabulous. The lack of education. If you think all Harlem was like that, you don't know Harlem. West side of Harlem had Langston Hughes. We were just out of, we were just out of the, the Harlem Renaissance, celebrating the beauty of Harlem, celebrating the beauty of African Americans. Langston Hughes, poet, Madam C.J. Walker, the first African American millionaire. Painter Jacob Lawrence, Congressman Percy Sutton, people were celebrating on the West Side because they were educated. Education will give you freedom and opportunities. Don't squander it. It's right about then as I met a middle school teacher. I, I drove in here this morning and I saw the beauty of this complex that you're in and I Pray to God you're taking advantage of it. I had a middle school teacher who saw something in me I could not see in myself. That teacher said to me, Richard, look at your ability to paint. Look at your ability to do photography. So when you look at teachers in this building, don't, don't abuse them. Take them in, love them, let them lead you to where you need to go. You have a dream. Help them to get that dream. Don't want you to wake up and not having your dream fulfilled. That middle school teacher walked me through seventh grade all the way through high school. And you know what happens? In middle school, I was very close to my mentor. Every Friday, she would take me out of the Bronx. Now I'm living in the Bronx. Every Friday, she would take me out of the Bronx. She would literally take me on Saturday morning to the Cooper Hewitt, the Whitney, the Modern Art, the, the Natural History, all of the museums, stick paper and pencil in my hand and tell me how important artists were, that artists are cultural keepers and cultural makers, and she would teach me about lines and shapes and forms and colors. Hold on to your mentors. These teachers don't come here saying, I'm going to fail some students. These teachers come here to part their knowledge with you. Take it. But now I leave middle school and I get to high school. I'm away from my mentor a little bit. And you know what happens when you get to ninth grade, right? I found girls. <laughs> I found fashion. Ninth grade. Tenth grade, I found the beer bottle. Junior year, I found that fancy cigarette. Senior year came so quick, and I was not ready to go to college. Because I was messing around exactly what my mother told me. Do not mess with the elements in the streets. Stay away from those audience who are doing the wrong thing. Do not, and I got caught up. Vietnam War was there, and you were drafted. Six months after I'd left the high school, I was drafted into the Vietnam War. 
His brother said, my uncle's brother, my uncle said to me, his brother had just died six months before I was to leave. He said, if you don't want to die, you better join the Air Force. I joined the Air Force, became a dental technician, did four years real quick, and I said, I got to go back home and become educated. I went back home, and that middle school teacher met me at the airport. She says, are you ready to complete your education? Got into community college, did two full semesters in a community college, and got right back into my four-year degree, got right into that four-year degree. In that four-year degree, I worked as a paraprofessional teacher from 7 in the morning until 2.30 in the afternoon. From 3.30 in the afternoon until 10, 11 o'clock at night, I was a college student taking 16 credits. Four years, three years, happened real quick, got my bachelor's of fine arts degree. Then she says, now let's do the master's. Got right into the master's program, went to school from seven in the morning until one in the afternoon. From two in the afternoon until 10 o'clock at night, I ran four community arts centers in the South Bronx, Monhaven Community Projects. Education was giving me freedom and opportunity. And no sooner than I got through with that master's degree, I became a a photographer at CBS. Unfortunately, my mentor died before I completed my master's. But today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a nationally known African-American artist. I get anywhere between $2,000 to $20,000 a painting. My photographs have been in your textbooks for the last 30 years. Anything then by Prentice Hall, McGraw-Hill, Houghton Mifflin, Spanish, uh, Spanish, math, foreign languages. I have literally illustrated your textbook for the last 30 years. I woke up and I lived my dreams. You can do it too. You can do it too. So now let's show you another story. Something I didn't know then that I do know now. See, the problem with my mentors, my mother, my father, my sisters, and everybody else was saying, you gotta go to college, 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 but nobody told me how to go to college. Nobody gave me the hidden secret. They told me you gotta go to college, but no one has ever given me the hidden secrets on how to get to college. I'm about to give you the hidden secrets on how to get to college. I'm an admissions counselor, as you know, at the University of New Hampshire. As of November 15th, I'm off of the road. I'm sitting down. I'm going to read your transcript. At this, universe, at this school, Caroline Goulart is going to read your transcript. And we're going to do the application very much the same way. But if Caroline Goulart says, oh, no, I don't think we want this student, I say, oh, wait. Let me take the application. I'm the one who's going to say yes. Maybe or no. Keep in mind, you always had full control over me. I had no control over you getting into the college of your choice. But let me take you through a day in the life of your application. November 16th, this is what's going to happen. Now juniors, pay very attention. This is important to you. This is a year that if you messed up ninth and 10th grade, you definitely have to come to work every day now. You can't come to school anymore, cut the girlfriend stuff off, turn off the text, turn off the YouTube, put those little cell phones down. You carrying that football down there feel harder for the coach than you are sitting in the classroom for that English teacher. You throwing that ball in the hoop better than you are doing that math problem. And you think that's fine, coach can't touch you until the admissions counselor said, that's good. You're so involved doing the social life thinking that resumes are going to get you into college. Resumes don't get you into college. Academics, 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 academics get you into college. So here goes the first piece of your application on the seniors who are now applying. I'm going to look at my Notebook, I call it a notebook, it's the summary. I know who you are. I know what major you want. I know your GPA, I know your SAT scores, ACT scores. I know what kind of math, science, foreign language, social science, and English classes you have taken. 
And I am sick and tired of hearing that inner city kids can't do well on SAT and ACT tests. This school literally provides workshop for you. And we're in the process of networking with this, with your school, and I just saw a colleague of mine stepped in the back of the room who is extraordinary AS, um, a, a, um, SAT prep instructor. And with a partnership, I'm hoping that, boy, you guys get the opportunity to do this, get better SAT scores. Over in this area right here, everyone that you put on your team to advocate for you next year, every teacher, every guidance counselor who's going to write something about you, start treating them with respect. So when they write about you, they have only good things to say. As I look across the room, just shy of seeing angel wings, I'm thinking I'm in a room full of angels. So. Be mindful. These lines, you have full control over these lines. That first line could be an omit letter. The first line could be a whole letter. The second line could be whole two. The third line after a whole two is definitely, in most cases, a deny. I didn't deny you. You denied yourself that opportunity to study at the University of New Hampshire if that's a place you want to go. Next page. I know who you are. I know your name. I know your cultural demographics, the language that you speak, and I know um, whether you're a US citizen or not, right? Next piece of paper. And what do you guys think I'm doing? Notice I didn't go to the transcript first. I want to holistically know who you are just in case there are any problems in ninth and 10th grade. I want you to be able to have a defense team who is going to advocate for you to tell us what's going on in your life. Now when I get to your transcript, if there are any bad transcripts in here, you're going to be able to advocate for yourself and tell us what happened. So now I'm trying to find out who you are, mom and dad. I get to know mom and dad, what kind of work they do? What kind of education they have? You're the first generation in your family to go off to school. I'm trying to find out, you have sisters and brothers, are they in college? Who are you? Next page. Education. We know your schools. We know your schools. We know how many honor courses here, how many AP courses here. We know how many people go on to four-year public university, private university, community college, workforce, military. We know how many people even drop out. We even know the income of your parents in this neighborhood. All brought to you by College Board. Right? Every time you're filling out College Board information, you're providing information for institutions around the country. So we know you, we know this school, we have good relationship with the guidance counselors here, and we're building an extraordinary relationship now with Mr. Paul Neal. That's a plus. Because when we're making final, final decisions about your school, you create that final decision. You create what kind of yes, maybe or no letters we're going to give to the students either before you or after you. You're doing it. You're building the kind of quality schools that we want to be at. Next, value words, value words. From now on after this conversation, do me a favor, ladies and gentlemen. This is a list of words that guidance counselors and teachers are going to use to talk about who you are. This comes all off a of common app. What's academic integrity? What is a student's academic integrity? Is a student a leader? Motivated? Mature? Great integrity? So as you come here to school tomorrow, and you get off of those big, beautiful yellow buses, get off with this in mind. Please get off with this in mind, because next year somebody's going to have to say that you live these things. Testing, ACT, SAT scores again. Extracurricular activities. Important but not the most important thing to get into college. 
Matter of fact, if extracurricular activities are taking away from your academics, cut it off. Be bold enough to say, Coach, I can't make it today. If I can't make it to the English class, Coach, I sure can't make it to your basketball bouncing class. I know it's tough, but you have to pay attention to this. You have full control over your academic destiny. No one else does. Well, what do you mean by that, Mr. Ains? No guidance counselors, no teachers, no, no headmasters. No one has full control over your academic destinies. Let me show you a perfect example. My daughter was heading off to be a doctor. Sabina, did you do the science class? You wore homework? Oh, come on, Dad. She just came back from a lacrosse team playing, you know. Like, of course, Dad, I did the homework. Oh, I didn't see you do it. Dad, I did it. I'm going to have to take her word. Get into the student portal the next day, about half of the day is gone, open up the student portal, guess what? Chemistry teacher says no homework. She comes home, did you didn't do the homework? Dad, I did the homework. That guy's a drunk, all right? He's really just a big drunk. He probably lost my work. Go back to the teacher. Oh, I see some people laughing. So I know this has happened once or twice. So I go back to the teacher and I'm asking the teacher, so what happened? Mr. Haynes. I don't have the homework already. Who had full control? Sabina. So be very mindful. Okay. Writing. That essay. That essay is so important to you. Ladies and gentlemen, that essay is so important to you. Here goes one I read last year. Young lady, ninth and 10th grade, AB student. Junior year, academically, she fell off of the academic chart. C's and D's. But thank goodness I read her essay. Her essay says mom had a brain tumor. In the middle of the brain tumor, there's full so much financial distress, the dad divorces her. Academically, that destroyed the young lady. I held her, because admissions counselors have huge hearts. Not our desire to deny you. First quarter senior year grades came back. She's exactly where she was in 9th and 10th grade. Does she get admitted? Of course she does. That's a good time for that essay. Notice also disciplinary action. Now, some of you may have been here, and some of you may have been suspended once or twice, you know, hopefully in no real trouble with the law enforcement in your community. We want to really be careful, because we really look at what, who we're bringing to the campus. We're building a community so you can feel safe. And so we want to make sure we're bringing the right kinds of student there. So disciplinary action is very important. Finally, we look at what you want for a major, what school you want to be in, if you ever had any alumni affiliates. Now, we know all that fancy stuff about you. We want to know who are you academically. Now I look at the transcript. Bam! Do I admit this student? Yes or no? Of course. Yeah. Wonderful. I love that admissions counselor. Do I give this student money to come to this university? With a good SAT score, I give this student money. Anywhere from $6,000 to $10,000 a year, because this is a student who didn't come to school. This student came to work every day. Every day. Here goes another student. The battery on this probably is getting tired. University of New Hampshire, solid B, B plus. Do we admit this student? The student is a solid B, B plus student. But look, solid B, man, solid B, anybody can achieve B work. Yes, don't shake your head. <laughs> yes, right? This student get admitted because he or she is a solid B student. The batteries. This is a typical Typical American student, ninth grade, little weak, 
Ninth grade, a little weak. But the student manages to bring up the academic integrity. Notice, 10th, 11th grade. And that's what we call an upward swing. And some of you are going to ask me, Mr. Haynes, I didn't do well in ninth and 10th grade, but if I did better in, in my junior and senior year, do, can I possibly get admitted? Of course. Especially with a good essay telling me, what did you learn from making that mistake? Made a mistake, why did you make the mistake? What did you learn? And from that knowledge, how do you plan to move on? Already? Oh, this is my problem, child. This is a transcript that will take me a day to read. It will take me hours to read. Because I'm concerned. The worst part of our job is to deny a student. The worst part of the job. I don't deny you. You deny yourselves. Do we admit this student to a solid B, B plus university? Yes. Nope. Could this student go to college? Yes, yes and must. This student could go to a community college, some, some four-year university we even accept you with a lower GPA. But this student can definitely go to community college. Wait a minute, you mean to tell me all students go like this? That's the way they look to go to community college? Oh, no, 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 no. Not in this day and age. Students look like that first student go to community college because they're trying to conserve money. So that all A student would even go to community college if he or she wants to. But this student may have to go to community college to build up their academic foundation, taking some remedial courses, and then moving forward. But every student in this room must go to college. You must go to college. So important to you. Now I have my final, final piece here. What does that say? You have full control over your academic destiny. Now before we show that final piece, I have a, an extraordinary student here. I would like to have read something for me. If you don't mind, I'd like to share my mic with you. Maybe we can just stand here together, if you don't mind. I'll pin this on you. This is an extraordinary essay, so just in case some of you are thinking, so. What do I need to do for essays? Um, may I'll just hold it. <clears throat> Come on now. Shh. Here goes a wonderful essay. We know what we know today, and we cannot worry about what we know tomorrow. I reflect on this quote every day of my life. I was young, eighth grade girl, spending an ordinary, ordinary evening, chatting with friends and completing homework. After several days, of complaining about headaches, my mother and I thought it was necessary to see my doctor. I remember casually thinking I was suffering from seasonal spring allergies or migraines. My pediatrician decided to take a more aggressive approach in finding out the reason of my headaches. She, she remained very composed while prescribing my brain MRI. My world changed as a result of one phone call that same evening. My mother answered the phone and then called my name with a tone unfamiliar to me. The radiologist had identified a tumor positioned in my cere cerebellum and the, concerned, and the concern was that if it had remained undetected or allowed to grow, there was a possibility of death. Emergency surgery was required to save my life. Tears were shed throughout the night as I slept nested between my parents. Days and nights were filled with the challenge of what to expect that night, the next day, and weeks after. We had many comprehensive meetings at John Hopkins Hospital, John Hopkins Hospital, and each was, com <clears throat> and each was comprised with additional questions. However, one doctor visit stood out in particular. Dr. Ben Carson said, we know what we know today and we cannot worry about what we know tomorrow. Since that day, 
I remember how Dr. Constant explained to me that in life, we face challenges, and in time, we will learn to overcome the obstacles that stand before us. The power of living in the present will give us the strength and security we need to understand our future. Does anyone know that name, Dr. Ben Carson? Dr. Ben Carson, in the fifth grade, considered himself the dumbest kid in class. Dr. Ben Carson, in the fifth grade, considered himself the dumbest kid in class. Dr. Ben Carson would hide behind the other students, not wanting to give the answer. By the seventh grade, Dr. Ben Carson is in a classroom, and teacher science classroom, the teacher asks a question. When he asked the question, the students couldn't answer it. They're smart students. And all of a sudden, Ben raised his hand. Everyone went, Ben is going to answer a question. Ben answered the question with such profound intellect. The teacher started mentoring him. Ben Carson eventually goes to Yale. Ben Carson eventually goes to John Hopkins. Ben Carson eventually becomes the best neurosurgeon in the world. Lived the spell in Boston, goes back to Michigan, becomes the best neurosurgeon in the world. If I can accomplish what, I, what I've accomplished, and Ben Carson have accomplished what he could have accomplished, I truly know that each and every one of you will do the same. Doctors, lawyers, engineers, mayors, politicians, and eventually I'm looking in this room for all we know, I am standing in the presence of the next president of the United States. I truly appreciate your time. I thank you for your cooperation. You were extraordinary. But just in case you guys all thought that my story, my living condition could never be the way that I predicted, as a child, I made photographs of my neighborhood. I'd like to show you those photographs.